Uh, thanks so much for being here for this week's CHEP seminar. Uh, we have David Newmark joining us this week. He's the uh, Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Economics at the University of California, Irvine. He's also the Director of the Economic Self-Sufficiency Policy Research Institute. Uh, David is a very well-known labor economist who's published widely in the economics of uh, discrimination in the labor market, on minimum wage policy, and on the economic well-being of vulnerable families. And we're fortunate to have him here this week to talk about uh, the impact of uh, the earned income tax credit for the long run. Thanks. Thanks. Hour and forty-five. Is that good? Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. All right. So um, feel free to jump in with questions. You probably don't need that invitation. Labor economists never do. Tilt this back a little bit. So this is a joint paper with um, Pete Shirley, who was a student who finished last year. He's now in living the good life in Luxembourg. The Luxembourg Weiss or whatever that stands for. Nice job on that teacher. Um, and it's on the long run effects of the earned income tax credit on women's earnings. Um, so let me just give you a little background here. Joe mentioned this this institute I run, at least for now. If I get renewed, I'll keep running it if I don't find something else to do. Um, uh, and we're focused on, um, I use the word reorient very cautiously here, like to, to at least push the boundaries of what people are doing when they do research on anti poverty policies to, it, to also talk about long not that the short run effects are irrelevant. Resources for a currently poor family are important, but that's not the only question. Um, so today I'm going to give you a, an early version, not so early anymore, but I haven't changed the slide yet, um, of a paper on the long run effects of the EITC. And what we do here is, uh, as, the as the title suggests, um, turn from the typical short run effects that people study, and I'll tell you a bit of, I'll give you a little background on what those are, um, to the longer run effects. But the overarching theme of uh, what we do in this paper and other stuff I'm doing and other stuff other people are doing as part of the Institute's work um, is to ask what implications these policies, alternative policies have for long-run economic self-sufficiency. I don't know exactly what economic self-sufficiency means. It's kind of like there's a famous quote by Justice Stuart Potter, who's defining a long a case about pornography. He said, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. I can't define it, I think, but I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same idea. We don't know exactly what it means. Um, but the way I think about it is, the way I sort of rationalize it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a, you know, saying that economic self-sufficiency is, is a goal, it, it's not so much that people should be off of government programs, because there's a really easy way to get people off of government programs, just kill the programs, right? But rather, um, a goal of having people at high enough incomes that they don't need many government programs, I think is something almost nobody would argue with. They might argue about the political implications of making, you know, of doing research on that topic. But I, I think you know, there's broad agreement that that would be a good thing. Um, translated more concretely into political reality, I think um, if you had a policy that you could convince people on both, of both parties would increase people's earnings enough to which we probably wouldn't need to give them much support, both parties would get behind that. Democrats, you know, let's say, I would contend, have more sympathy for low-income people. Um, uh, Republicans are, are happy to have people earn more and a program that's going to actually learn, lead to people earning more and not depending on government is something they would they would get behind as well. Obviously, part of different goals about how to do that. But that's kind of what I'm after. And so what does it actually mean? I don't know. It means higher earnings. It probably means not, ha not having dependence on many government programs. I was pushed when I was writing the proposal for the center to make that more concrete. And I said, well, um, if the only program you were dependent on was a programs that encouraged work, that would probably still count. So the EITC, and I'll chart this later, you can get the EITC at least a little bit up to 40, the high 40s, right, 40,000, 45, 46,000 dollars. I don't think you just have to be earning 50,000 plus to be economically self-sufficient, but by the time you get to that tail end of the EITC, that's pretty much the only income support you're getting. You're not getting welfare, you're not getting Medicaid. So that's a, a sort of fuzzy working definition of of what I'm talking about. Little, you know, higher earnings, little dependence on government programs, except maybe for the EITC. Um, but here I'm mainly talking about earnings. Not gonna get into that other stuff. So let me give you a little background on um, uh, kind of on, on the main anti-poverty policies, at least that I'm focusing on uh, in my work more generally, and how little we, you know, what we know about short-run effects, which I will only touch on very briefly, but the point is more how little we know about long-run effects. Um, now you could say, you know, what is the set of anti-poverty programs? There's a lot of them. I don't, 
I don't include food stamps in any of the work I'm doing yet. I don't include Medicaid. I'm focusing on the programs that affect income from work or work incentives. So I'm really focused on, there's other people in ESPRI who are doing like, you know, investments in children and all this kind of stuff. I'm really focused on, let's think about policies that change how much you earn from work or change your incentives to work. Um, from minimum wages to EITC to welfare time limits, let's say. Um, what did those different policies do in terms of long run earnings? Presumably, I mean the mechanism we have in mind here is presumably a policy that encourages work will lead to earnings growth over time via the usual human capital channels. But it might not because maybe the people we're affecting are in some crappy jobs that there's really no earnings growth. It doesn't really matter. Um, the minimum wage, if you, you know, there's diminished job opportunities early, um, might lead to some foregone experience. But the effect of the minimum wage is, at least in theory, on school and your training is ambiguous. So maybe it leads to some skill growth because people say, I have to qualify for higher wage jobs. We don't know. And the, the evidence on that is actually pretty much all over the map. So those are the kind of, the, among all the things you would say, all the anti-poverty policies and what they do for long-run effects, I'm really focused on sort of those most directly related to work incentives. OK, so with that said, I'm going to talk very briefly about minimum wages, welfare, and then more on the EITC since this paper is about the EITC. So minimum wages, there are literally hundreds of studies on employment effects. Um, they're almost uniformly short term. The famous Cardin Kruger paper, um, New Jersey raised its minimum wage in whatever month it was in 1992, and they come back, and Pennsylvania doesn't, they come back nine months later. So that's really short term, nine month change in employment. Um, a lot of panel data estimators are, you know, they're averages of differences of different lengths. There's this great paper Andrew Bacon Goodman wrote sort of laying that out, but a lot, of, there's a lot of short different studies. Um, uh, so, you know, we learned something from that, right? But we don't learn much about long-term effects of anything. Um, there is some work on distributional effects, which at least gets closer to what the core question is, but that is also very short-term evidence. Um, the long-run evidence, and I think I, I, think I said five, I left one out. There's another training paper. I think I said five. There's four papers I cited here. I know one more. I don't think there are any others. I might be missing one or two, but not many, which is kind of amazing because there's hundreds of minimum wage papers. So long-term effects. Does this work? Yeah. So there's, a, there's some work on training. This is one paper, and Washer and I have another one. Um, and the idea there is we don't actually know what will happen because uh, you might increase training to qualify for jobs, but if two ten employers are paying for training by reducing your wage, the minimum wage creates a floor and might eliminate your, just like any other benefit might get eliminated, training might get eliminated. Um, uh, this paper with Nizalova, and I have a, re, a, a new paper with, with Courtney Schuch, who's a PhD student in Berlin. Um, we look at this question of whether if you were exposed to a minimum wage at very young ages, typically teens, are your earnings later lower? The black box, well, well the, that, that's the black box. What we have in mind going on inside the black box is you have somewhat fewer opportunities to work, you gain less experience, your earnings are lower down the road. We can't go inside, in, these, in this paper we don't go inside the black box. I'm doing some, trying to do some work now with the NLSY to really sort of model the, the year by year accumulation of experience and see if we can, rat, we can understand what happens. Do people actually work less? Does that lead to the kind of effects we find that if people in the 30s are actually earning less or is it something else possibly spurious? Yeah. Do you know, you, you've done work, I know, on sort of technological change in response to minimum wage and automation. So is there, is there, you don't have any evidence yet on what sort of change, technological, how technological change might affect, affect the longer run opportunities for people with different levels of the skill distribution from minimum wage? Not long run. The one paper we did, which just came out, is, is on, it's again, it's short. It's not, it's, you know, short panels. No. I mean, it's, it's not that short panel, but it's really focused on short, short run panels. Um, so there's that, and then um, and Jeff Clemens and uh, Michael, right? Michael Wither in their paper. There's many versions of this paper. I cite the 2014 version. Um, this is this thing on you know wages in the Great Recession. It's a great paper. Um, the part of the paper that hasn't gotten much attention is trying to sort of look at these people who were hit by the federal minimum wage increases relative to other similar workers and look at what it does to their earnings trajectories, right? Kind of their earnings growth subsequently. Um, and they find, so all these papers find some evidence, not very strong, I would say, of adverse long-run effects. So that's the minimum wage in the literature, more or less, in terms of long-run effects. Um, <clears throat> welfare, the literature is obviously even more extensive than the minimum wage literature. Um, uh, I only cite two studies here on long-run effects of welfare. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert on welfare. 
But I asked, I wrote this research for it. I wrote, I wrote, I asked many, many people to look at it and tell me if I was missing anything and no one came up with anything else. Um, so there's tons of papers on, you know, labor supply effects and all. These are the only two, and these are both about things that happened post welfare reform, um, where they studied specific interventions that were meant to boost employment and training of, of welfare recipients um, and did find, uh, both of them find some evidence of longer run effects. So that we, <coughs> these, these programs did see, if we sort of encouraged welfare recipients to work, we did see some evidence of longer run wage growth, which again, you might say isn't surprising, but others have said, Again, the jobs are so lousy that there is anyway. It doesn't matter. You work these, there's some jobs you work in forever and your wages never go up. It doesn't really seem to be true. Um, there's the old argument by Charles Murray, I think, I think his most famous book, it's hard to say, um, but Losing Ground in 1973, I think, um, where he did what he usually does, which is he draws one graph, it's a correlation, and then he writes a whole book about you know, long calls the story, um, but he's provocative, and this book makes a simple observation uh, that we implemented all these anti-poverty programs and people were still poor, right? And then from that leaves this whole argument that, that welfare creates a culture of dependency and all that. So there's clearly in there an argument about long-run effects. You create a program under which people can live without working and lo and behold, they don't work and lo and behold, you come back 10 years later and they're still poor. You know, not much serious evidence in the book, but that was certainly um, the argument. Okay, so now it's certainly the IT. So I should say, I have another paper. Oh, no, I'll mention it later. So the, this paper focuses on the EITC. So for those of you who don't know what it is, um, real quickly, this is a graph which is your income on this axis, and you can see it goes up to around 50,000. And this is the value of the subsidy. Uh, there's four lines here, child, this one child, two children, those are the same color. Well, they're not really the same color. They look the same color. And this is how much you get from the EITC. So the way it works, think about the two kid families. That's actually what I use as my policy parameter. Um, so this goes up right here, it's at around 5,416,000, it's a 40%, it's a 0.4 slope. So with two kids, you get up to around your first, as of 2014, up to around your first 16,000, it's now closer to 18, up 40% subsidy year. And you get a check from the government. And most of these people are paying no federal taxes, so that's all you, you know, that's your, that, they pay social security tax, but in terms of income tax, that's it. So it's a huge subsidy, right? Um, this should have only an intensive margin effect, uh, an extensive margin effect, sorry. If you're not working, there's no, in there's no income effect, there's only a substitution effect. And, and that's what we find. Um, so that's the way the ITC works. There's this little blip for people without kids. I'm gonna treat that as non-existent, which is what most research does. There's a lot of policy debate about whether to actually make this a lot more generous. Some people argue that doing so would make, you know, men who, this is mainly, but we know that um, when people are, have out of wedlock children, they tend to look at the mothers. So there's this pool of men out there who for tax purposes are childless because the kid doesn't live with them more than six months a year. So people are arguing for making this more generous, say that will make them more marriageable or reduce crime, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there might, you know, we don't know. Um, uh, one kid, the subsidy rate isn't that different. It maxes out at a lot lower level. And then two and three, the three kid is only since the Great Recession. That, that, that was at least two, two plus. So it's a very generous policy. Um, not much here. Um, there's really not a big difference between one, two, and three kids, certainly on the extensive margin incentives. And then you can see what I said before, that it actually goes out to a pretty high level. There are people out near 40 plus thousand who are getting some money from the ITC. Um, Just curious, when a couple gets divorced and they have joint custody, is it considered that they both have a child? No, it's where the child lives more, more of the tax year. Only one parent is pregnant. But 50% is the norm these days. Well, more than six months. So they, only, they, only, they, they, will, they will force the parents to write down one household or the other. And they, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not big on the implementation. There used to be a little bit of fear of fraud in those cases. I don't think it was so much divorce, but probably people never got married. But now it's all verified through social security numbers so they make sure the same kid is being claimed on two tax returns. Um, this is a system where, like every program, there's a little fraud and slippage, but it's done through the income tax system. So it's super efficient, it's, it's easy to do, probably not a lot of cheating. Oh, so that's called the phase and rage, the plateau. <laughs> so, um, so, short run effect, so again, there's a lot of work on the short run effects of the EITC. Um, uh, well, there's a lot of work on the EITC, I should say, and almost all of it focuses on short run effects. Um, tons of papers on single mothers. Why single mothers? Because with kids you get a lot more, and if you're single you're probably low income. There are, of course, high income single mothers, but most of them are low income. Uh, clear evidence, this is, this is probably in labor economics, 
well, maybe except for the return to schooling, the most unanimous literature there is is a positive causal effect. I only know of one study um, that doesn't find positive extensive margin effects of the ITC, and it's a study of one state. It's a Maria Cansey, and they sort of extend something to three kids. It's a fairly weak policy, and it's one state. Who knows? But there's lots and lots of studies confirming employment effects. Um, if you go back to sort of people out here, these are more likely, well, they're higher income people. Um, since this is based on family income, they're more likely to be married, right? So out here, there's a negative effect because you've got both a negative income effect and a negative substitution effect. And the research says maybe there's some negative effects out, out, out at those levels. Um, we may not care so much because we may really care as in, from a social policy perspective, most about getting money to the low income families and obviously we have to phase it out when we don't get it couldn't afford such a generous program. So not a big deal, but there, there's some mixed evidence. Interestingly, people often summarize this as saying modest negative labor supply effects. One thing to keep in mind is there's a lot more people out here than here. So the aggregate labor supply effects could actually be pretty big. They're just sort of hard to detect in the micro data. Right? Uh, so, but that's not really my focus here. And then there's some focus on short run distributional effects, which for the EITC are very, very good because it's based on family income. Right, it's exactly the opposite of the minimum wage, which is based on low wages, which is quite loosely linked to family income. But that's a topic for another day. Um, very limited work on long-term effects. The only paper I know that's looking at um, you know, people of working age affected by the EITC and what does that do in the long term is Dahl and a couple others, Gordon Dahl, San Francisco. And they look at these, this, expo this federal expansion. I'm going to show you the policy changes later on. There's a big federal expansion of the ITC. They kind of try to use that with you know, sort of simple diffs and diffs kind of stuff to infer the longer run effects of that on earnings and find some positive effects. There's this other literature, and I, there's this URL here. You'll probably have the slides left over. This is sort of this inventory I wrote. Um, and it, it touched on this other work, which is about the EITC's effects intergenerationally, right, on children's health, children's education, and the like. Um, I'm just, I, it's probably positive. Um, I think some of it's a little oversold, I'm not sure. Um, but I'm, I'm really not focused on that. But there is that longer run literature which is growing. And I should say, in terms of this debate about long, uh, the, the long run effect, I, I and others have speculated in talking about minimum wages in the EITC that the EITC probably has better long run effects because it encourages work rather than discouraging work. But that debate and argument has been made in the complete absence, near complete absence of evidence, which is well, partly what I'm trying to rectify. Okay. So, um, uh, so we know that the XC boosts employment of, single, of low skilled single mothers, but the key question is can we find evidence that exposure to a more generous EITC over the longer term boosts earnings, presumably, not necessarily, but presumably through the accumulation of more labor market experience and the earnings growth um, that creates. Uh, we're also, since there's that possible negative effect for married women or higher income women, um, but you don't use income because that's endogenous, so people tend to use marital status. For, also endogenous, but we're going to ignore that. Um, uh, um, you know, we're also going to sort of see if there's these longer or negative effects um, for that. Okay, and it's complementary to a couple other studies. Um, as I said, the positive incentive effects of the FTC may work better, may have more, better long run consequences than the minimum wage or than welfare. Welfare is sort of clearly discourages work. Um, it's a paper with, with Brian Asquith and Brittany Bass. Um, one of your graduates on the market this year. Um, we study, we don't study, well, we study people, but the, we, one, of the, one of the challenges in this, I should have said, in this research is you try to study, it's always harder to study stuff over the long term because we don't have that much long term data, right? We don't really have good long panels on people. We have the NLSs, but that's like a single cohort. So that's not very useful for policy variation. In this paper, we use the PSID. This paper, not the one referenced here. This particular paper, we actually, study census tracts instead of people, because if you, if you track census tracts over time, you can study them for many decades. Um, so we run this sort of quote unquote experiment of, um, you have, we, we have census tracts in different states, but states are running different time series of policies with regard to minimum wages, earning up tax credit, and there's federal policy too, um, and features of welfare reform, time that we focus on time limits. And we ask for those different histories, what, what are the differences in sort of the relative performance of initially disadvantaged tracks relative to initially more disadvantaged tracks? And the answer is not, I wouldn't say it jumps out at you and says, no matter what you do to me, you can't make me go away. It's not one of those kind of results. Um, but there's a good amount of evidence, and two things, two things most strongly, 
that the EIT, uh, generous EITC does boost the relative performance of disadvantaged tracks, um, and time limits um, also do. So time limits, I'm going to get trash for this, I'm sure, because people don't like time limits, but it seems like time limits, at least viewed this way, created long-term work incentives, which, of course, was the goal. Uh, which does mean they're good for everybody, so I'm saying. Okay. Um, this paper is different, we just put just the ITC. So what do we do here? Um, I'll give you a warning. I'm going to talk briefly about the data, and then there's going to be a few slides of these really ugly equations. <laughs> Not theory, just purely empirical equations, which look really confusing, but I, I think I have a way, I, there's a reason we're doing it this way, because at the end of the day, it boils down to a very simple interpretation. So just like bear with me or tune out, but make sure you tune back in. Um, so we use PSID data because the PSID is, is a, is a long-term longitudinal study that isn't tied to specific cohorts, right? Because it starts with the initial cohort, which is all ages, and then if you're born into the sample, right? And there's some, there's some people added, but for the most part, it, if, as families expand, they're all run into the PSID. So it's a very cool data set. Um, uh, what we use it to, what we want to do here is think about all the things we want to capture. I want to capture your earnings over time, because that's what papers about. But, yeah. um, I need to know what EITC you were exposed to. So I need to know what year you're in. That's not a challenge. I need to know what state you're in, because there's state EITC variation. Um, and then I want to track, since the EITC has different effects on you depending on whether you have kids and whether you're married, I want to track your marital fertility status, so year to year as well. So what we're trying to do basically is observe different women who have a different combined history of marriage, fertility, and EITC incentives, and sort of characterize these different women. So a woman who faced a very generous EITC and had kids most of the time and was unmarried had a lot of positive extensive margin incentives over her life, not her, roughly 20s to 30s, well, 20s and 30s is what I'm doing. Um, a woman who never had kids didn't, didn't really matter very much. A woman who had kids but was married most of the time in a generous EITC, generous EITC state probably faced negative work incentives over more of her life. So we're trying to sort of characterize people in terms of that history um, and then say, what are, how are they doing as adults? And what we define as adults, I don't know what adult means, but I'll be one someday, um, but we call it roughly, roughly age 40. And that's dictated, one second, by two things. One is, you know, you're pretty much done with your kid childbearing for sure, and you kids are a lot of them moved out of the house. So we're focused on low-skilled people, so they, have, they still have kids relatively young. And two is, if we go to too old an age, we have almost no data, right? Because we've got we to gotta see you for a couple decades. Do you consider the endogeneity of whether they got married or not, had kids or not? No, no. Uh, I, I mean, it's a, it's a potential issue. I have to believe it's, I just, I've yet to see a paper where not just marriage or fertility makes much difference to the evaluation of any program. I just think it's second order. You know, could one estimate a structure? You, so we're gonna do this in a very reduced form way. One could do it in a structural manner. And you could still treat those as exogenous, or you could treat them all as not. It makes it a lot more complicated. It makes it a lot more complicated. It's, you know, it's something somebody might try, um, but we know, here we treat those as exogenous. Uh, so the PSID is the only data set that kind of can do all these things, um, except for tax data, right? And I'm working on that. We're working on getting access to like 20 years of tax returns through people at the census. So we'll see. Maybe five years from now. But that would be super cool. Because as you might imagine, those of you who know, the PSID isn't that big. It starts with 5,000 families. It expands. But we're going to end up with a data set of around 1,000 low-skilled women and 1,000 high-skilled women. The tax data, obviously, is the universe. Um, so we could, we could learn a lot more. And it has, um, you don't have education. So I, I don't have a way of, of, of like, figuring who's a low-skilled person. But you do report your occupation on your tax return. So you can maybe infer it. But all the other stuff is there. If you did marriage. Um, and in fact, the tax return, you know, it's like it's it's you know your tax kids. It's like who lives in your house for more than six months. Here, the PSID, I know who had a kid, which isn't necessarily the right measure for the ITC. It's obviously closely related, but I, I can't pin that down. So that would be really cool. To be okay. So what we do is, I remember I said we want to sort of capture that what I call now the exposure history. Like what incentive? How what were the incentives for you? Were you did you have kids? Were you were you married or unmarried? And what was actually the generosity of the ITC at that time and in that place. Um, so we want to sort of capture that exposure history, but otherwise I want to do this in exactly the same sort of double difference or triple difference, and there's actually a fourth difference here if you really pay attention, um, that people use in the short run literature. And we do that uh, partly because that's all I understand, frankly, but also partly because um, 
it makes it very common. Right? It lets you think about what we're doing in the light of that other evidence. So, so let me first just briefly say what we would do if we were just estimating short run effects. And then I'll show you, that's easy. I mean, it's, those, those equations are messy. These things you've seen before with different labels. Then I'll tell you how we uh, construct the sort of characterization of your marriage, fertility, ICC history. And then I'll sort of drop another equation on you, which sort of is the triple difference with all those things in it. You'll see. OK, so in the standard approach, we have some outcome y, like log earnings or whatever. Um, and we have data here on you know, people in states J and period T. Um, it's common to focus on the phase and rate, which I'll just denote CR. That's the slope of that, that EITC budget constraint at the beginning. That's because that's the extensive margin incentive. Um, so we, we do everything here with the max credit, which is how high it goes. Later on, it makes no difference. Um, K is going to be just an indicator for whether or not you have kids. We don't use the number of kids, which may help with endogeneity a little bit. It's just, it just gets. It gets hairy enough just doing it this way. Um, so if we were just estimating sort of, we want to say, does the agency affect earnings or employment or whatever, we'd run this equation. We have the credit rate, that's the policy. We have the kids' dummy and the interaction between the two, and then uh, state dummies and year dummies. And that's a triple difference estimate, right, with the fixed effects in there. Um, it's, we're, we're estimating the effect delta off of the difference between the change in employment associated with EITC, gen, EITC getting more generous women with kids, that's one diff and diff, <laughs> minus the change for women without kids who serve as the control. So that's a standard triple diff estimator, and that's a version of which people do all over the literature. Uh, there was that modest phasing rate for people without kids, that little yellow bump at the bottom. Um, you could interpret this as the effect of that. Um, I don't want to. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I interpret this more as a control for what you're usually doing in the triple diff, which is other shocks correlated with the ITC. And then the identifying assumption is that the shocks correlated with the ITC that affect Y um, for women with kids are the same as those for women without kids. So that's just, I just think about this as, you know, kind of uh, sort of saturating the model with, with policy variation. In, ter in terms of this, the state variation that's usually used, is it, is it, how many of the uh, credits are refundable versus not? They're almost all refundable. In this paper we did, in other papers I've, I've tested for a difference and can't find much, in this paper we actually didn't do that. It's, it's just a few, it's a handful of states, not many. The mo I'm sorry, I said they're mostly refundable, is that what I said? Yeah, that's what we most of refundable, right. So you could, instead of having this, you could put in a full set of state by year fixed effects, mm -hmm. right, soak this up, it's a more saturated model. Um, in fact, that is what people do in this literature. For what we're doing here, you can't do that, and I'll explain why later. Um, okay. Um, one issue you might worry about, you know, we are, <laughs> economists are really good at, at diff and diff kind of models, and we often forget that that means we're really good at relative effects. So I've, I, mean, I can't tell the number of times I've talked to policymakers and I've said, you know, minimum wage reduces employment, and they say, well, does it reduce overall employment, or does it reduce employment of one group relative to another, and we're never really good at the absolute question. It's always a hard question to answer. Um, it's an issue here um, because the EITC can hurt people who aren't eligible for it, right? And there's some evidence of this. I have some work in my paper with Washer and Andrew Lee, I think with the first Andrew Lee, who will be Prime Minister of Australia within 10 years. He's a Harvard PhD, who did economics, and he clerked for the Supreme Court in Australia, went to Harvard, got his PhD, became a professor, was on the equivalent of the Federal Reserve Board, and, and now he's a parliamentarian, and he's all over the place. Right? Plus, he runs a marathon in two and a half hours. <laughs> and he's only a little younger than me. Um, so he's pretty impressive. Anyways, he was the first one to do that. We have some evidence of this. Um, the idea is, of course, labor supply shifts out. That's what the ITC does. That's how it boosts employment. Um, if, you're, if you're an EITC recipient, your market wage falls, but you're better off because you get the EITC. That's why labor supply shifts out. Um, but if you're not eligible, but you're the same kind of worker, you just all you get is the lower wage. Right? So in our paper, for example, we see that female teenagers um, probably take it on the chin more than anyone from the EITC, because they're not getting the EITC, but they're competing with the women who are. Okay. Um, so that means we could find a relative effect that looks um, bigger than the absolute effect. So we could, we could overstate the benefits. Um, that's what it's is, is having children or not a function of those EITC policies? Do you mean is it endogenous, or do you mean does having children affect the ITC payment? Whether it's endogenous or not. Well, okay, so first of all, it does affect the payment. Um, so people in the EITC literature have focused on this question of does marriage respond, does childbearing respond, and haven't really found much of anything. 
I mean, I, you know, and I think the reason is kids are expensive enough that <laughs> policy, doesn't, policy doesn't matter that much. You know, I think my, my, I'm not an expert on this, my, my impression of the literature is people respond on margins that are cheap. So when people look at like C-section deliveries before and after January 1st, because the way the tax law works is if your kid is born December 31st, you get the full year tax exemption. And if they're born January 1st, you don't. So that you'll do, because it doesn't really cost anything, and it's worth a few thousand bucks. Um, uh, but like have a kid or not because of the policy. I mean, I'm not saying the effect isn't there, but I think it's an omission. My guess is if I spent three years figuring out how to deal with it, I'd end up either with the same answer or uninformed answer. But I could do it. Um, so that was for, um, that was, sorry, that was back to here. That was for, usually you're doing this for single child, single women, with and without kids, as indicated by here. You can also add married women and sort of the same set of interactions. And now you're gonna have just sort of a second triple difference in the equation. One for single women, one for married women. And you might expect a positive effect for the first, negative for the second, on short-term employment. Um, and then you can also add high-skilled women as a control, either instead of the married women, because you might think, Maybe theirs, they have, you know, we don't know who the shocks are common to. Are they common to low-skilled women with and without kids? Are they common to women with kids, whether they're low-skilled or high-skilled? We don't really know. So we just throw all the differences in and we, we do, we add high-skilled women as well and another level of differencing. So what we end up with, this is where it looks ugly, but it's actually not so bad. So what's going on here? Same outcome. Um, so now we have, like before, we had credit, right? I, we had that before, we had credit, and we had credit times kids, remember? Now I've, I've got unmarried and married interactions, so that's why, that's why they've all cloned into a pair. And then I've also got less educated versus no interaction, you know, highly educated, no interaction. So I've basically just taken my credit, kids, credit time kids, and now I've got four of those, for married and unmarried, and for low educated and high educated. So it looks like a mess, but that's all that's going on. Okay. And I'm really interested in these two. That's why they're in yellow. Pretty sneaky, huh? Um, <laughs> these are the, the effects for unmarried, low-skilled women with kids and married, low-skilled women with kids. Okay, that's all. Okay, so that's that. Um, and then we do one more thing, just because, why not? Um, which is we break women up into whether uh, they are in their 20s or in their 30s. So we're going to do this characterization of marriage for children. I see over 20s and over the 30s. Um, oh, sorry, that's not what I was I didn't even say it. Oh, we do that. At, but that's not what we're doing at this time. We're going to break them up into whether their kids are school age or not. Sorry. And that's because you might think that the EITC has different effects. If your kids are in school, the state has already taken care of them seven hours a day, right? Your reservation of wage may be a lot lower than if you have school, you know, preschool age kids. So the effects could differ. And we also break them up by whether the women are in their 20s or 30s just to see if it matters if it doesn't. Um, so the basic idea is the same, but we just keep sort of, we disaggregate a lot to see if we detect differences across women based on the age of kids or the age of mothers or anything like that. Okay, so that's that. And now this is, I think, just the one slide on, yes, on this, what we do, what about, the, how do we go from that to a long-term equation? So here's all we do. Um, we take, what I say here, the average over long age spans, from in the 20s and 30s, of the interactions between the phase and rate, that's the credit rate, what I call CR, the slope of the first part of the ITC budget constraint, um, whether you're married or not, whether you have kids or not, and sometimes whether your kids are old or not. Okay, so what we have, instead of this variable here, so this was the one that was the credit times whether you have young kids now, so I broke it up, whether you're unmarried, times the low education indicator, Instead, we're going to average that over, in this case, ages 22 to 39, and I'll tell you why in a minute. We're just going to take the average of those, that triple interaction, this just sits out here, and this is going to capture, we don't just want the interactions of the averages, because if we, if we average the interactions, and we realize this after much screwing around with the data, um, it's kind of obvious after the fact, as it often is, I actually want to know not just did you face a high credit and were you unmarried for a lot of years, but did you face a high credit in the years when you were unmarried? Right now, or when you had kids. So that's what we do. So this is so basically, if you had, if you were in a high EITC state or later years when the EITC is higher, and you had, you tended to have young kids in the household, which means you had them early and kept having them. So you always had young kids, and you were unmarried a lot. This average is going to be high. Okay, if you low EITC, you didn't have kids who were 38, so you only had a young kid at age 38 or 39. 
um, you weren't unmarried that much, this this interaction is going to the average of this thing is going to be pretty low because you're mostly going to be averaging a five to three zeros. So that's the idea. Um, that's our that's our characterization of kind of the marital history, fertility history, the ITC history. Yeah. I have two common questions related to this. Okay. So one is, is there a particular reason why you're, this is, this, you can view this as like a constrained dynamic specification, right. right? Right. Is there any particular reason why you prefer the constrained model? Meaning, like, shots right. you happened could, you, right. a long time ago, you're in your specification right. so we, have the same weight as ones that right. contemporary. We, we have, all right, so you could, well, I think all you're saying is, why some of these? Why don't I just have these? If this is from 22 to 39, why don't I just have eight, uh, say 18, 19, whatever the numbers? Interactions. Age 22, age 23, age 24, and see what the difference are. Sure. Yeah, we've, we've thought about estimating that. The problem is, well, yeah, because, you're, because you don't just have two of them. You have, you have sure. corresponding to 16 of them. And I think with 1,000 observations, we'd have eight degrees. I haven't calculated, but not many degrees of fear. If we get the tax data, we'll, we'll have 100 million observations, or maybe more, it's a lot of years. Um, we will. Because I think that's right. I think that's an interesting question. For sure. Uh -huh. So fo yeah, follow up question yes. to that is so kind of reinterpreting what you're doing. So yeah. rather than a dynamic spe constrained dynamic specification, you could view this as filtering, right? You've got like a, a boxcar filter on a time series of indicator variables. I'm not familiar with the phrase boxcar filter. Okay. Well you're you're I remember common filters from graduate school, whatever boxcar. You, so filters. you're filtering some time series data with, with yes. what you're doing. The individual time series. Correct. You're indiv you're well, the, yeah, yeah. You sort of define a new variable that's the product of all of those. You're then filtering it for a person, right? Um, right. So something to think about that I am con currently confused about is with the continuous variable. You're you're correct that the interpretation of the coefficient then has this like horizon-based interpretation because mm -hmm. uh, it has to do with the you're filtering the covariance of the interactions. Blah blah blah. Um, I don't know how to interpret that with dummy variables. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of having a, a little bit of a hard time. So is it, does, sort of when you say you don't know how to interpret does that mean you're not sure how to interpret a high value of that average versus a low value of that average? Is that like no, I'm having a hard time interpreting your delta, what your delta is going to be describing. Oh, I absolutely agree. And the first tale I'm going to show you, there are going to be deltas that don't mean anything. Because, partly because, I can't change one of these without changing other ones, right? Because you can't go. I can't. I can't give you more years unmarried. Well, I can't give you more years unmarried without giving you fewer years married. Um, so what we're going to do is translate these into different <laughs> scenarios. I'm going to. I'm going to sort of choose representative marriage and fertility histories, and show you the implied differences in, in Y across those sort of different scenarios. What I'm going to do is we're going to sort of construct two scenarios. One is going to be sort of a. I think we call it paper. Extreme extensive margin, women. So women who had. Young kids for a lot of time and, and were never married, that's one extreme. And the sort of extreme intensive of marriage, women who had um, young kids a lot of the time, but were always married, and then some sort of other intermediate cases. So I think that's, because we, we, you'll see that I, I'm going to put up the first table of coefficients, and I'm going to tell you these don't mean anything, which people don't usually do in seminars. But well, I'm not, I'm not convinced that that's true. I'm just. With that, which is true. They, they don't mean anything. Well they, they, well, they don't mean anything in the sense that they're not meaningful. What I'm talking about was maybe different what you're talking about. Sure. They're not meaningful partial effects, because I can't change one variable. Like, we all, you can interpret, you know, a coefficient is like a partial derivative, but I can't actually hold the, I can't change this one and whole other variables constant. So in that sense, they clearly don't mean anything individually. Your issue may be different, but, but I think they'll both, I think when we do these sort of representative scenarios, I think, I think that gives a clear interpretation. But maybe not. I have some really big effects, so maybe I'm misinterpreting them. Mm -hmm. Which would be great. Are you taking into account whether these women who are ages 18 and older are taking any classes if they're in school? Right. So, so first of all, we chose that. That's not an age. That's 18 years back. For so we actually started at age 22, and we started. It seems a little weird because people have kids earlier than that. We started at age 22 for two reasons. One is because the one you say. Um, we sort of looked for when, I mean, there's always a little bit of schooling in every year, but after age 22, there isn't much. Between 18 and 22, there's a lot. Um, the second reason is, and this is nothing to do with education, um, the, a lot of the PSID questions were asked only at the head of household, and it's not clear 
what we're learning about 19 year olds from that. So we, by starting a little later, we're missing a little bit of early fertility, but if I see a kid in the household, I don't know whose income is determining who get what the ITC payment is. So it's, it's kind of a mess in that respect. Because whether they are in school or not is very crucial because you, you're trying to get the long run effects of, of uh, possibly on the job training. Right. And you know, whether they, you know, they acquire additional skills during that time or not would also in, influence right. no, that's their right. long term earnings. No, that's right. We certainly could make, do some regressions where Y is final school. Um, let's see what they're we may have done that at a Okay. Uh, okay, so just a little bit of identifying variation because it's, it's not obvious exactly what's going on here. Um, so within a cohort that is born the same year, women are, of course, exposed over the life to the same federal EITC. Um, but then there's state EITCs, and I'll show you the, the variation in a minute. Um, we define exposure based on marital status, sort of like what I call your marital status and kids' roster that is in each of these years. What was your marital status? How many, how many kids or young kids did you have? And as far as that goes, that means that both federal and state policy variation are going to identify um, the policy effects. Now, I'll tell you why. So suppose you were, let's go back to our sort of short-term analysis. Okay, so I'm running this triple diff regression, right? I could put it in this model, and I've done this in, in the paper in Washer I cited earlier. We could actually put in this model interactions between kids, number of kids, or just the dummy for kids, and year. And that would wipe out all the federal variation the ITC, right, because it just varies by year and kids, okay? And if you do that, actually, you, you still, in the short run regressions, get kind of the same employment effects we've been talking about. Um, it kind of meant the state variation delivers similar to the ITC effects, and that's what we did in our paper. In our analysis, we, we, we thought about that that would be a good thing to do, since that's sort of, you know, the most rigorous, if you will, in this reduced form identification. But the problem is, you know, what, what are you trying to do here? Well, it, here, it's just the dummy times year interactions. What you'd have to do for our specification is you'd have to take sort of all possible values of these, these cross products, these, of these products of three variables, which is your credit times kids times marriage status variables, and then interact all those possible values with a set of year dummies, which would be impossible to do because they're sort of a, a nearly infinite number of values. So there's really no way to simply soak up that we've been able to think of all the federal variation in this approach. Um, so we are using the federal variation. Um, you know, we like, I mean, in labor economics, we, we often push our specifications when we're doing minimum wages or EITC or whatever to sort of wipe out the federal variation because it could be spurious. Um, the effect could be spurious. On the other hand, federal variation is real variation, so we shouldn't sort of assume it's invalid to begin with. But anyways, here, we're using both, just to, just to make that clear. Okay. So the spirit of the approach is we sort of take this quasi-experimental framework, the kind of typical dif differencing approach, um, characterize people's exposure, and then and use the same approach here. As we said, in principle, you could estimate a structural life cycle model. Go at it. It's not, not something I'm going to do, but it could be valuable. And, you know, complementary evidence. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disparage it. I just um, I thought we'd at least do this first because I think it's, it's transparent. Okay. So policy variation, a little bit. Um, so this is this isn't quite up to date. Um, the data here this ends in 2011. Um, this is the EITC. There's no EITC until 1975, I think, 74, 75. And then when it first starts, there's a single EITC. No matter how many kids you have, it's 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 um, it jumps to a 10% phase 10% uh, phase rate. Pretty trivial. Um, bumps up a little bit here, and then. Uh, right here, this little change over the 86, this is the, what was the Reagan tax form, whatever it was called, tax form act in 1986, whatever. This is the expansion, it goes from 10 to 14. The famous Aisa and Liebman paper, which is kind of the first employment effects EITC paper, is actually about this expansion. It's, it's not much of an expansion. Um, and then there's this huge expansion in the 90s, right, where it jumps very quickly from 14 up to 34% of you have one kid, 40% of you have two kids, and then again, as I said, there's this little thing at the end where people with three or more kids get even more. So that's the federal policy variation. Um, here's the state policy variation. So there's nothing here because there's no EITC. And then the federal EITC starts here. There's still no state EITCs. And then I show you, then, then the gray squares are the number of states with an EITC. 
So I think this is two and then it goes back to zero. I don't remember why it goes to zero. And then you can see since then it's crept up and there are now almost as many states with their own EITC as states with their own minimum wage. Um, and minimum wage is now 31. It's hard to keep track. It kind of changes every week. Um, as my colleagues say, and yours probably said the same thing, you don't appear to be winning this debate. <laughs> <laughs> and I can always say, what's the counterfactual? <laughs> Um, anyways, and then these are the means of that. So you can see what happened is early on you had a few states and they were really high, and then as more states came in, they're lower. So now the average state rate is around 10%. And what that means is that most states simply say, um, take your EITC line from your federal tax form, write it here, whatever the dollar amount is, multiply it by 10%, by 0.1, and that's what you get from the state. But uh, you can see the range is actually somewhat bigger. Um, that's what most states do. California, amazingly enough, didn't have is not didn't have an EITC here, despite being a very liberal state. Passed its EITC, I think, in 2016. They actually it was amazing what they did. They they had an 80 percent phase rate, 80 percent supplement rate, sorry, which is sort of, um, and it went up to I don't have the graph anymore. So you know I showed you it went up to a max at around 16,000 for two kids, and then was flat and went down. California's hit its max at half of the federal max, so around 8,000. There was no plateau, and then it came down at an 80% rate. So there was no plateau, and, and the phase out wasn't any slower than the phase in. So I got a call from a legislator like a year and a half ago. So I'm introducing this bill, and, oh, and plus, we're raising our minimum wage a lot. Right? So what's going to happen in California, and this legislator was smart enough to figure this out, was that, um, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> was smart enough to call me. Um, you know, so you're going to have to have this max at 8,000 with this huge kink in the budget constraint. And then, of course, people can hit that in lower, at really low hours because the minimum wage is going to be $15 an hour, right? So they actually passed a law to um, extend the phase-out rate quite a bit and then uh, the, the, extend the plateau and have a slower phase-out rate, which costs some money, which the LAO didn't like. But, they, they, you know, but I, asked, I asked her after this hearing, I said, so like, why, what brought this to your attention? And she said, my constituents tell me they can't get anyone to work more than part-time, right? Which is exactly, you know, like and low, you know, daycare workers, like exactly. So it's kind of nice. Um, okay. David, before we, well, I'm curious on the, the y-axis on these graphs, we have the phasing rate or the phasing percent, and then the state supplement percent. Um, is that this app, this graph? Yeah, and then the, the previous one with the federal. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of the magnitudes. Right. So this is so those are the phasing rates. Those yeah. magnitudes we got. Right? right. Okay. This is the the percent supplement. So if the state supplement is 50 percent. They would take whatever your EITC payment is and give you another 50%. So, so okay. it would make it a 60%. 50% would be would make it effectively a 60% supplement rate instead of 40. Got it. Okay. okay. So a little about the data set. First of all, I told you I ended up with a couple thousand observations. You might say why. Well, let me just explain why. So we start with all people who have ever responded to PSID, 77,000. I'm a new woman, so that cuts it in about half. Okay. So, and then. The big reduction, there is attrition in the PSID, there is missing data, because I'm, you know, this long panel, so all that matters, but it doesn't matter that much. The huge cut is, I want to say, let me take the number of PS, female PSID respondents who I potentially observe from ages 22 to 40, right? And that is the huge cut. It's just because either they came in too late, uh, they were past 22, or they don't hit age 40 before, they, before the PSID ends. And then you start to do all the stuff, so that's a sort of mechanical. And then we do. Then we sort of say. Um, then we take potentially observed from '96 to 2014. That's because of some issues of, of how questions are asked in the data set. So years before that are not useful. Um, so that gets. Us, so this is all sort of mechanical. Who's in the sample? And then you start to see full year state history. So we know what state they live in every year. All the complete data. The sample size isn't really getting that much smaller. We lose. We come down to here. Um, number of sample restrictions. Um, and we, end, we go from that kind of 3,200 to 1,800, which for a big panel data set when I want 19 years of data isn't so bad, right? I mean, there's some attrition, there's some potential bias, but hard to address. But that's the sample we end up with. And of those, around 800 are low skill, which means final education is less than high school or high school grad, and about 1,100 are higher skill, uh, higher education. OK. So the first thing we do, a little short of time, but we'll move through it. Is the first thing we wanted to do, we thought this was important, was to say, can we replicate the other short-term results with the PSID? Because if we can't, and I don't find anything, you're going to say, well, that's not very interesting, because you can't even replicate the short-term results, so why should I take no result for long-term effects as informative about anything? So we tried to replicate 
um, the two key papers in the literature in our group, the Aisa Liebman paper, which I mentioned before, and then there's this paper by Bruce Meyer and Dan Rosenbaum, which looks at the 1990s expansions. Okay? So here's the Aisa and Liebman replication. So this is, these, this is, uh, well, oh, that's right. So this E and L is them, and replication is us with the PSID. So let me just tell you what's going on here. So first of all, let's look at Aisa and Liebman. They have a bunch of different, they're doing very simple diffs and diffs. So one is the treatment group is women with children, women without children, and they have their pre-reform and post-reform employment rate. So the women with children, their employment rate goes up by 0.02. The women without children, their employment rate goes from 0.952 to 0.952. So the diff and diff is exactly 0.024. In the PSID, we have a lot less data. This is CPS, 47,000 observations. We have 2,300 for this replication. Qualitative, I mean, it was a similar estimate, 0.014. It's not significant, but it's a much tinier sample. Um, so that replicates pretty well. This one replicates terribly, right? They, get, they always get positive, not significant here. Here we get this huge negative number, but this is a very narrow control group. This is uh, less than high school without children as a control group. So that's, I can flag that with a different color. This one, we use a control group beyond high school with children, and we get positive effects. And then a couple more where we actually match quite closely here and fairly closely here. So qualitatively, the PSID delivers you know, similar estimates, sometimes significant. But remember, first of all, the sample's small. And second of all, this is the policy reform we're studying here. It's tiny. So small sample, small change. Not surprising. Mm -hmm. Meyer and Rosenbaum, sorry, are doing this change here, like 90, kind of starts in 91, 90, 91 to 96, huge change. So this is their data. All they're doing here is estimating uh, these are marginal effects from a probit, bunch of stuff in here, and the, the variable I'm showing you is whether you have any children times a year dying. So what you see here is negatives to, I think there's a, a negatives to around here, neg minus, pretty, except for this one number, a lot of minus 0.1s, which means women with kids have about a 10 percentage point lower employment rate, and then the reform hits somewhere, I mean it's really big here, it actually hits here, and that penalty gets a lot smaller, it kind of becomes insignificant. We replicate an X, Q sample. This one we have a lot more data because now we can use a lot more years. Um, and we actually um, replicate it pretty, uh, in some sense even better. We have negatives more or less through here. And then it really falls to zero. And you can see as you come out, it's, it's, it never goes negative again. It's positive and sometimes even significant. Um, so, so in that sense, we're, we're replicating. And this is year by year. I could sort of aggregate, obviously. It's, a little smoke and mirrors make the standard error smaller, but pretty clear you're getting this change from women with kids working less to working the same or even more in the PSI data. So it looks like we can get the short term effects. Uh, this was great news because about a year ago the project we said, we really should have done this first. <laughs> so fortunately it worked out okay. All right. I'm going to skip these descriptive statistics because we're getting a little short of time and they're not that interesting. Okay, so these are the coefficients that don't mean anything. Okay, so what are these? I'm going to tell you what they mean, and, and I mean, they mean, maybe they should have but so first of all, what's going on here? Five out, so I'm looking at women at age 40. I'm going to vary that later and show you it's pretty robust to different definitions, so don't worry about them. Get hung up on that. Five outcomes, cumulative experience, which is not a great measure. This is the number of years in which I see you with any work. That's a really crappy measure, and it's going to, I'm going to show you other results which is going to suggest it's really a bad measure because we're going to find really big hours effects, which suggests that I really want an hours weight. If I want to say, are women exposed to a more generous EITC when they're unmarried with kids, um, working more over their lifetime, I really want an hours weighted experience measure. But the way the PSAD data are asked, you don't get the hours of each individual until much later in the sample. You just get employment information. So that's unfortunate. And then we have current employment at age 40, log wage if you're employed, log earnings if you're employed, um, and annual hours. Um, we could do the, you know, the inverse hyperbolic sign thing now to deal with the zeros. It's sort of, the, it's very cool actually. I don't know, I know we thought of it for a long time. Um, there's not much of an employment effect, so nothing doesn't really change that. Okay, so what are these, what are these eight, co one, two, eight coefficients? I'm gonna jump ahead, and this is again, that equation from before. It's these eight coefficients. It's the low ed interactions. Uh, it's the uh, sorry, it's, it's these guys, the interaction between the tax credit, phase rate, kids, marital status, and low education, and then it's broken up by uh, whether your kids were young or old and the age of the women. So that's why there's eight of them. So I'm only showing you the, the triple diff estimates 
what you might call impregnable specimens that we actually care about. There's a lot more parameters than the hot Okay, so what do they show us? Well, oops. There it is, okay. So what do we say? So here's this, this coefficient. I won't interpret it yet. Um, it, there's this positive significant coefficient which says that if you were exposed to a high retype EIPC when you were young kids and when you were unmarried, from your in your 20s in this case, boundaries in the 30s, um, you have more cumulative experience. And what does this 31 years mean? It sounds like a big number. There aren't even 31 years there. Don't worry about that. For, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, uh, less clear evidence of a positive effect for sort of adult employment at age 40. Um, if we look at um, hours here, right, um, this, is when, this is now women exposure in your 30s. These two numbers are positive. These are women who are unmarried. So there's some positive hours effects, I'm, I'm, sorry, earnings effects for people who are um, you know, near age 40, and there's some negative effects if you are married. That's sort of consistent with these cumulative, right, extensive and intensive margin effects over time. But um, they're not statistically significant. That's right. Hold on. Some are, some aren't. Um, this is the hours effects, and again, you see these ridiculous, like, what is this? Because people work, you know, 2,000 hour years. Okay, so that's, so all I've showed you so far is a bit on the signs and what these mean. Um, now, why don't they mean anything? Well, one reason is, as I said, they're not partial effects. I can't change this without changing something else in the table. In fact, without changing all of them, um, at least at the same age. Um, but just to give you a rough idea, forgetting that problem, I have these numbers in, in square brackets. What are these? These are the effects of a 10 percentage point increase in the phase and rate for one year. So for one year when you're, when you're exposed, so like when you were unmarried with young kids, for one year, the phase rate was, was 10 percentage points higher. And that's what these are. So that at least gives you a way to scale these coefficients. So if you face a marginally more generous EITC for one year, this would imply you have about 0.4 more years cumulative experience when you hit age 40. That's still a really big number. Right? How do you know it's a really big number? Well, here's a calculation. Suppose 10 percent of women work one additional year because of the higher EITC, which is roughly in line with the Meyer Rosenbaum estimates. Um, over eight years, the average effect on cumulative experience would be, you know, would be about a, a, a 3 percent of that, right? So these estimates are really big, um, and they may not be meaningful. You have to keep one thing in mind. I'm going to show you some more sensible estimates in a minute, but they're still going to sound really big, um, and I'll acknowledge that. But there is the potential for cumulative effects here. I work more in the first year because the ICC is more generous. Because of that, I invest in not just you know observable skills, but everything that's going to make me more attractive in the labor market. So it's conceivable there are some sort of very beneficial snowball effects here. We don't really know that, um, uh, and that's you know kind of for future research. Okay, so now I'm going to do something much more interpretable. This is in response to your question. Um, so what we do here instead is we we have these three scenarios. We take um, we take those coefficients, which are multiplied by those those average products of terms, right? these sort of histories of marriage, fertility, and the ITC. And we sort of figure out the values. We take the sample averages, and then we also take these two extremes. Early children never marry, so they face sort of really long, you know, extensive margin effects for a long time. Uh, early children, and you see, one, one in 22, one in 24, always marry. It's not sort of a crazy extreme, because they don't have young kids for 18 years, because then you'd have to have like seven kids, right? Um, they have two kids early, so they have young kids for a pretty long time. Um, one never married, one always married. And we calculate the, the, the implied estimate using that previous table on outcomes. I, I don't do cumulative experience here because it's, I don't have a good measure of it. And this is adult employment, wages, earnings, and annual hours. So what do we get here? So what does this mean here? Um, so this says um, if, you were, if you had kids early and were never married, your employment at age 40 is higher by about 0.25 percentage points, which sounds like a big number. Um, that's positive and significant. If you, were, um, if you were always married, you get a smaller, it's still positive and significant. Sample average, you get around zero. This is then the difference um, from column two, so that's this minus this. So this, is, this coefficient right here, the second one, is the difference in the effect for those who, they both had their kids early, one was never married, one was always married. If we think their extensive margin effects are going to dominate that comparison, then in the long term, you should be making more, uh, sorry, working more in this column as an adult. And then this is the difference relative to column three, so that's relative to the sample average. So there's one number here because it's this minus this, and there's two numbers here with this minus 
this minus this, that's that number, and this minus this, which is that number. Okay, now to help you interpret this, I'm gonna color code these. Okay, so what is green? Because it's a lot of numbers to look at, but I think this helps figure out what's going on. Um, so green are the coefficients that we would predict would be positive, right? Because this is this is the this is sort of the the women who have, who face long term extensive margin incentives to work relative to women who face long term intensive margin incentives to work um, uh, here or you know or it's either relative so it's these women early children never married either relative to these folks or relative to these folks so they on average were married less and had kids early and you would expect them to be positive if, if these extensive margin effects dominate and. Kind of amazingly, every one of them is, right? Um, uh, uh, significant at the 10% level, in some cases 1% level, 5% level. Um, pretty small sample, so I, I'm kind of surprised much of anything is significant. This is definitely one of those papers where I didn't expect to find strong results. Okay, um, then I'm going to color code. I used to use red, but turned out red in PowerPoint becomes invisible in most seminar rooms. Um, these are the effect. What are these? This is the women with the um, more intensive margin effects, because they have kids that are never married, are always married, relative to the sample average. And you'd think those would all be negative, because these women face stronger intensive margin effects. Um, that one isn't, but these three are, and this one on, our, on log earnings is significant. Now you might say, why not, why don't I turn it around into these women minus these, these women? Well, that's just the opposite sign of this coefficient, so that's already the table. Okay? So I give you sort of all the relevant comparisons here. Okay? So, I interpret this as kind of, you know, pretty interesting evidence that we're getting, we're seeing these cumulative effects at age 40. Now, I don't know what's next. Okay, what about these magnitudes? Because these, these, these actually are interpretable. Well, they're still really big. So these right here are our wage, log wage and log earnings effects. And they range from 0.36 to 130 approximately log points. Um, and for those of you who know the approximation, 130 log points is, is quite a bit more than 130%. That's the way. We know the approximation is bad as you get away from you know, 0.05, 0.06, but that's the direction in which it gets bad. It gets bigger, not smaller. Uh, I wish it was the other way around, but it isn't. Um, is it largely incredible? We do this calculation. If your return to experience is 4% a year, five additional years of experience would increase wages by around 20%. So maybe that's not that implausible. Um, uh, we don't see that when we look at years of experience, but remember, because we see these hours effects here, these are actually our strongest results, we really would want to know sort of accumulative hours weighted experience measure to really know kind of how much did you work over your 20s and 30s because of this. And we, in these data, we just can't do it, unfortunately. Nor will we have to the tax data. There's no hours in the tax data. Um, um, you know, but, um, but more generous, more greater labor tax rate may generate other investments. Um, we could have it. The other thing to remember is even though these are big percentage estimates, these are on a very low base. These women have very low average earnings. So it's not like you're earning 60,000 more. Average earnings, um, uh, oh, 12, about, on average, a $12.5 wage in current dollars, 19,000 in earnings. So, you know, 30, 40% on those numbers doesn't, is not an unreasonable number. It's still, it's still they're still big. Um, they have big standard errors. Um, that's what it looks like. But anyways, the sign of the effects, um, is consistent with what we'd expect if the EITC leads to accumulation of more human capital, higher earnings, um, higher wages. So now I'm going to go zip through a bunch of tables, um, almost all of which are going to say the results look, most of which are going to say the results look almost identical when I do other things, some of which are going to be somewhat weaker, um, but still point in the same direction. Yes? Um, so kind of circling back to the what you're doing with this average effect. Right. So I haven't seen any of this stuff in panel context, but in the time series literature, there's some pretty well-documented issues with these, what are called long horizon regressions, when you're accumulating a regressor variable. And so where, what context do people do that in? Like growth? Uh, so a lot of times in finance, but also in sort of monetary um, economics, there have been some, some studies of this where they're, okay. sort of, um, oftentimes it's returns that they're aggregating. Um, okay, that makes sense, right. But, um, but it's, it's been used in, in broader context as well. And so one of the main issues has been that there's well-documented, um, it's not spurious inference, inference, but the inference is non-standard when you, when you accumulate um, left or right-hand side variables like this. And so I'm wondering if there could be some, again, since you have these sort of dummy variables, I'm not totally sure if this is a valid so, analog here, right. but- Is there a good intuition for what's 
what spurious is it? It's not that it's spurious. No. It's that it's um, it's well, sort it's of overstating. It's non-standard asymptotics. And so if you're if you're sort of S, if you're performing inference based on just sort of t stats or something like hmm. that, the t stats need to be adjusted. Um, so even though the and it, it does the, even though there's no accumulation of the dependent variable, or that's not clear. Well, right? so that's, it's not, that's that's what I'm not clear yeah. about in this context. Yeah, okay. So I think, okay. I think it, yeah. given that you have some sort of question mark still about the magnitudes of your effects and. Um, you know, you, you have the question mark, is this credible, etc. Right, right. You're kind of trying to tell a story. I mean, alternatively, there, there may or may not be this at right. play. Um, so okay. I think it would at least be worth like taking a peek at that. I'll ask, I'll ask, my, I'll ask my time series here. guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is that what it's called, long horizon? Long horizon regressions, yeah. Never heard of that. It's good. This is like when I gave my paper on networks and someone said, haven't you ever heard of the suitcase problem? <laughs> Does anyone know what that is? It's like this, this yeah, mathematical yeah, yeah, optimization things, sorting problem. Like right. Because we were as many big things in Because we were trying to problem. shove workers into firms randomly mm -hmm. and see if what we actually saw was was consistent with neighbors working together. Right. But and it turned out there's there's no one unique way to yeah. it. So it actually is exactly the same problem. But I stared at that person for a long time for <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. So first of all. Um, let me just vary a few things. So, so this is one of the tables that where things are somewhat weaker, but all I'm doing here is instead of doing the pooled model with low education interactions, this is, this is the same estimates. So now I'm actually, sorry, now I've simplified it even more. Now I actually show you just the comparison. So this is early children never married versus early children always married. So that's a lot of intensive, mar extensive margin effects. Early children never married versus average, also a lot of intensive, uh, I keep saying more, extensive and early children marry versus average. So you kind of expect positive, positive, negative in these three columns, because I'm not sure before, but I've got even fewer things here. Right? Just a second, can you stop here? Yes, just to um, say it again. So what's the intuition about the coefficient of log earnings being negative in the third column? Because these are women. Oh. Here the comparison is between women, these are hypothetical women who had Kids early and were always married, so they faced the strongest intensive margin effects, which are negative, to work less relative to sample averages. And you could do them relative to the women who had kids early and were never married by just flipping the signs on these. Okay. Exactly the same. Okay. Um, so here what we do, here's just the pool model. These are the low education interactions. Here we just run the model separately for low ed and high ed women. And you see here something which may or may not be disturbing. I, I'm sort of of a mixed mind about this. You know, one might say what you'd love to see is zeros here, right? And these effects are exactly the same here. And that would mean it's being driven solely by the variation for the low education women. Um, if that's what we're always looking for, we should never run triple diffs because what that says basically is, I don't think the higher education people tell me anything. So I'll, I'll use my favorite minimum wage paper as an example. Um, uh, Cardin Kruger in their, in their New Jersey minimum wage paper um, find the minimum wage increase in New Jersey but not in Pennsylvania. Um, was that when the minimum wage increased, employment in Pennsylvania fell but was unchanged in New Jersey, and they say that means the minimum wage increased employment. So we're always using the relative comparisons. You know, so I, I don't have a strong view here. I'm sure referees are going to kill me about this. But, um, but the point is we're still getting the, the signs here that we expect 12 out of 12. Pretty good, right? Positive, positive, negatives. Um, it is the, and these are always the opposite. 11 out of 12 is one exception here. Um, these are actually bigger coefficients and more statistically significant. Um, but you can see, obviously, these are just the differences between these things. That's where the relative comparisons are coming from. But you, you do have to believe, to believe our estimates, that what's going on for the Hyatt group is pretty shocks that are associated with the ITC and all this other stuff and are common to the low education and high education women, and it's sort of an untested, untestable identifying assumption. So that's one caveat, I think, that, you know, even though I don't think you have to see everything here in zeros here, I think everyone at least intuitively is a little more comfortable with it, even though that intuition might actually be wrong. Okay. Um, is that? Uh, here we just vary whether we only pay attention to the age of the children or only the age of the women or neither, this is a much simpler specification, so I don't split up the women in two age ranges, I don't split up the kids' ages. These estimates are almost identical, so that has no impact. I'm gonna zip through the ones that are important. Here we, we vary whether we look at women at age 40, we do, we do more ages than we do like 38 to 42, 
with the, I, I'll have to have a few here. Again, these estimates are very similar. So there's nothing, we didn't sort of, we certainly didn't pick H40 after the fact because the results were good, nor did we get lucky, right? Um, uh, that's pretty robust to different ages. Uh, here, just a little more substantively interesting. One thing you might worry about is women who want to work move to states with high EITCs, right? Again, migration in response to policy, it's hard to find much of an impact. Um, I think the only place you probably see it is migrants coming to the country deciding where to go, just like business, a new business deciding where to go might respond to policy, but I don't think businesses move much because of policy. Um, anyways, so we do two different things. We fix, we just sort of keep you in your state, you're in at age 22. Which, is, which you can think about as an instrument, a really hard instrument here, or we only use the federal variation. And, here, um, and, which ones, and you can see these are also very robust. Are these well. educated, non-educated? This, this is always the interaction for the low educated women. So this is always low educated relative to high educated. I see. That's what we're always doing. So it's robust to that. Um, this is just the max credit instead of the credit rate, very similar results. This is the most interesting one. So one of the big problems with studying the ITC, and I will wrap up in two minutes, is that um, uh, there was a big expansion around 93, 94, 95, 96. There was also a big welfare reform in 96, 97, 98. Um, and, the, and the waiver started in 92. So how do you figure out what was going on, right? So what do we do? Um, we, we, people who study welfare reform have tried to code up like all the features of welfare reform, but it's almost impossible. It's like, there's this paper by, I forget his name, with Michael Keane, where they have like 70 policy variables. You know, but 50 states, so that's not very useful. Um, we simply take the following, we, we simply code up whether there was a waiver in your state between 92 and the rollout. So the rollout started in 96, and then when it rolled out, because it rolled out over two years. So basically, if you never had a waiver, the waiver dummy is one. When your state rolls out TANF, there's a dummy that turns to one. That's a welfare reform dummy. Um, and if it's part of the year, we just make it fractional. Um, if you had a waiver, we turn the, a waiver dummy on when your waiver starts. And the way it works is the waiver stayed into effect. There was no intermediate. If you had a waiver, it stayed into effect until your state rolled out TANF. So we kind of have these two dummies for the waivers and for welfare reform, and there's some, a little bit of time varying information there. Um, what they're going to do, though, is soak up. Essentially, they're going to just work like, like sort of time-state interactions, almost, that soak up a lot of the variation right around the federal EITC expansion, because that's when they happen. But we put those in the same kinds of variables, those cumulative averages. So basically, all everywhere we have them with a tax credit, an EITC tax credit, we have one of those for the waivers and one of those for the for the TANF rollout. So it's adding a lot of variables to the model. Uh, and what it does, in terms of signs, actually, virtually nothing, which is kind of amazing. Um, it does make some of these coefficients, um, sorry, it's this panel here. It does make them insignificant in every case, but the, the, the signs look good. You know, and here's the baseline. And you can see they're getting a little smaller, 0.5 to 0.3, 1.3 to 0.8. These are still pretty big estimates. The standard errors are quite a bit bigger, <coughs> which is not surprising because you're, you're basically we have two policies that change at overlapping periods, and we soak up welfare reform in a really non-parametric way. So we're kind of maybe we're shooting ourselves in the foot here. If I took some sort of continuous measure of welfare reform, maybe I wouldn't find as much happening. Um, alternatively, we just put the minimum wage in the same way that that doesn't make any difference. Um, okay. So conclusion: uh, exposure to more generous EITC when women were unmarried and had younger children seems to lead to higher earnings and hours in the long run, um, perhaps higher wages. Um, turning around and applying that to married women, you tend to find some effects in the other direction. So it's consistent with what you would expect if you just sort of accumulated the short run effects of the EITC. And you might say, or you say two things. You could say the results aren't super strong. They're not robust to everything we do. That's true. But I think they're, you know, they're pretty, the signs and magnitudes are fairly robust. Um, you could also say it's not very surprising. I'd say that may be true, but we didn't have any evidence on this, and now we do. Um, I'm sure it's not the last word. Um, uh, the effects are larger than we can account for, and I said this earlier, by increased labor force experience. If we just look at cumulative experience, the effects aren't big. But there's a real data problem there that we can't measure cumulative experience very well. So either an hour's weighted experience measure would show a lot more impact, and that would explain the results, or there's stuff other than accumulated accumulation of experience going on, unobserved human capital investment. Those are so I've given you a hypothesis about two things I can't measure, so I can't really tell which one it is. But I think parsing that out with other data, we can think how it would be good. Um, so, so we know that the ITC boosts employment of low skilled, generally single mothers in the short term. And that result, I think, in its unanimity across research, 
has really, I think, forged a very strong policy consensus in an era when there are almost no consensuses among the parties that the EITC is a good thing. It wouldn't surprise me at all if even a, even a split legislature and, and Trump raised the EITC in the next couple of years. Um, I think this actually gives you, you know, even more support for doing that because it seems like there are, let me, let me phrase it carefully, far, there are more, much more likely to be positive long-run effects of that on the same women who benefit in the short run um, than not or negative effects. So it seems like you're also going to help these women sort of achieve higher, um, higher kind of lifetime earnings. And I think that you know, certainly adds to the policy support for the ITC. Um, I have one question. So, yeah. So since you have like 20 some um, you know terms in your regression, have you ever thought about this multiple hypothesis testing issue that by random chance you may have some significant coefficients? Well, I mean, I told my student, Brittany, who gave a paper the other day, I said, everyone asked about multiple testing now. Five years ago, no one asked about multiple testing. <laughs> so I would say the following. Um, I mean, we have a lot of coefficients. So first of all, I mean, look, you know, it's a high. It's high well, there's really only eight that I care about. Right? It's just these, these sort of triple interactions. Um, I tend to think of the multiple testing more as I could have put this in the model, I could have put that in the model. You know, and the, the classic example that people beat up on is um, what's his, uh, Ted Miguel. You know, he, he talks about these these sort of you have these RCTs in developing country and there's 200 outcomes, right? Because they're coming from some kind of administrative data, not from a survey, and people are running the outcomes on the the random intervention, and a five percent significant level, ten of them come out significant. So we haven't we haven't thought about it here because I don't I don't think it's a. I think there was a calc I don't have the calculation out of my head, but when your um, your coefficient is up to a certain number, then you're almost for certain you're going to have at least one to two significant um, coefficients. I forgot the number, but well, no, it's going to be the percent equal to your significance level if you if you know, if your if your coverage is right, if your p values are actually right. But I think. I mean, here's the other reason I'm not worried. Of the signs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the greens are predicted to be positive, the reds are predicted to be negative. We're kind of at the 90%, I didn't actually count, I'm just guessing. 90% right there, and that can't be random. I mean, yeah. well, it could be, but it seems extremely unlikely. So yeah, it's a good question. I haven't thought about it in the context of just, I've estimated a lot of equations with a lot of parameters, and it, that's not the context it usually comes up in. But, you know, I see your point. Can you say anything about the trajectory of the labor market experience, the types of jobs, the, the anything, if you're thinking about sort of these cumulative effects from additional human capital on can you, can right. you, what kind of information do you have that lets you get at any of that even descriptively about what's so, going on with these women? So that gets back to the question about the sort of unrestri unrestricted dynamic specification, right? So my response to you was, um, I could sort of estimate, there's two different things you could do. So my response to you was, we stick to the one equation, but put all these things at every agent. But the other alternative is you go back to, well, you keep the cumulative equation, but you estimate it through age 22, through age 23, through, you know, you can do that. And then I don't have this problem of degrees of freedom because my sample size stays the same. And we've thought about a follow-up we do that, and you mentioned schooling. That may be a, a, a better way to both get it, you know, it doesn't solve, if there is this problem of accumulating effects, it doesn't deal with that because I'd still be accumulating them. But it would give you a sort of a better description of how these women's careers are evolving. Um, you know, the problem, it's a little, I, we, we don't do it here because the problem is at 23, there isn't much of a cumulative effect because mm -hmm. we're only starting at 22. So I'm not quite sure how to think about it. You can tell we sort of struggled a lot. With, it's very funny, I was telling some of this before. This is funded by the Arnold Foundation. The Arnold Foundation, even when you're doing non-experiments, requires you to, find, to file a pre-analysis plan, right? Which in an RCT is often really easy because I'm going to, at the end of the day, compare means, right? I mean, we, I, I actually have to look back at our pre-analysis plan, I'm a little scared too, because we had this, the, I, I did write down some regression equations, which I think actually are somewhat close to what we thought we were going to do. But as we developed, we really struggled. How do you, how do you capture this history in a model? And, you know, we thought a lot about it. I think what we're doing is a, a sensible way to do it. I'm definitely not going to say it's a little sensible way to do it because it's just, it's just not exactly clear how to capture all this sort of time series richness. Yeah. Um, it would have been even better if you could show that your EITC effects for that population are continue to be robust to the inclusion of the welfare reform. I agree. And I wonder 
what you can do to still show significant results uh, while taking account of welfare reform. And is there any way that you can just take out those years where TANF was introduced? Well, I'm guessing that And then look at the later, like yeah. using a gap or something and, and using similar. later years. My guess is that would look very similar to what we're doing. Because that, that's, that's close to what we're almost, we're almost dummying out those years. Just letting them all have their own. Every, we're, we're almost letting every state have a unique intercept every year when welfare reform is going on. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, so I would say, you know, so that approach, what we're doing, are pretty non-parametric. I'm more inclined to maybe, and we'll see what referees say. They haven't, so far haven't liked this paper, but we're all stubborn. Um, um, you know, I'm all, I'm, my inclination is maybe if we keep getting grief on this, go the other way and parameterize more, like put in a welfare benefit variable. Mm -hmm. So you're now gonna, now the, you know, you're gonna pin the, because now I'm not just gonna arbitrarily pull out the years because I might actually just be pulling out the federal EITC variation, which I don't wanna do. Yeah. Um, the problem is, well, you know, Welfare reform wasn't just changing benefit levels. Welfare reform was so multi-dimensional, right? You yeah. know, I mean, Becky Blank talks about like changing the culture of welfare. Office. And you hear you just have the so introduction of that. Well, that's okay. I mean, that's okay because I think the dummies will sort of are sort of uh, capturing everything that might have changed without specifying. But if I put in sort of, you know, like in my other paper, I have welfare benefits and time limits. Those are important. People talked about those time limits was a very salient feature. Um, but if I just put in those, I'm missing other aspects of welfare reform. So if I kind of do a, a more tightly specified version of welfare reform and my effects look stronger, you would say exactly the opposite. You're being too restrictive and maybe welfare reform did other things and how do you know? So we're sort of, that's why I say we're sort of going, we're bending over backwards here, but you know, that's probably the better thing. To and do. a related question, are the long-term effects of welfare reform well known? I mean, because you- The long-term effects. No, there is Using much. this methodology, has has no. anybody shown how powerful this tank was? No, we could we could run sort of these models with welfare reform. We haven't. So the other paper where we study tracts over time, we do a bit of a horse race. We do minimum wages, EITC, and benefits and time limits. Uh, I haven't done it in this framework. I think this would be very interesting. Yeah, no, it's very could. interesting. Yeah, we could do. We could. Because in a way, what TAM was, was like an intense version of what this EITC does. Right, Four. with a lot of other things, because TAN have had, I mean, I, I guess the issue is, I, 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 what I worry about is the, again, EITC is, is, is a simple policy, right? It's a subsidy work. You know, TAN have some states, the child care, I mean, there's so much going on, and some states, you know, the benefit level change, but the bigger change is that no one gets the benefits anymore. And that's not really policy. I, it's just, I don't know. I, I might leave that to a welfare scholar to do because uh, it's just so hard. I've sat at a lot of welfare seminars and listened to people try to explain how they're going to characterize welfare. And it's just, it's not just benefits and time limits. It's a bunch of things. But I agree in general. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.